The first trailer made it seem like Agent 8 was alone in this strange world. But in this second one, we see that she's not completely alone anymore. This puts the story in a completely new perspective. But even though the vibe in this one is different, some things remain the same. Like the consistent use of the number 8. The number 8 is everywhere in Sight Order, and by extension, so is the symbol of infinity. This DLC has incredible branding, and this goes beyond the use of the number 8. Pearl has a strong and consistent visual identity, and so does Oct. My hope is that by the end of this video, you're as impressed as I am with how thoroughly everything is planned out to make it all as consistent as possible. So let's look at the number 8. The character we play as is Agent 8 from Octo Expansion. She's an Octoling, and in this DLC, she seems to be accompanied by Oct, which is 8 in German. Oct's producer name is Deadfish, which just so happens to be 8 characters long, just like the word Infinity is 8 characters long. And of course, Infinity is just an 8 turned sideways. But here's where it gets really interesting. The theme of Infinity capitalizes on the idea that this DLC is a roguelike, though style of games are seemingly infinite, with no two playthroughs being exactly the same. And since it seems that the DLC also takes place in a simulation of some sort, then it's fair to say that this place should be able to simulate infinite iterations of the same thing. The infinity symbol is subtly present with anything related to the simulation too. The main logo used for the reward currency is an infinity symbol with two lines going through it. The two lines I see as a visual pun for a dollar sign, but with the new logo. This new logo, by the way, is a simplified version of the one on Pearl's palette. Pearl is no stranger to the infinity symbol either. The Pearl robot has the exact same logo engraved into the back of the design. And while this could be a stretch, one of the only images we saw in the first trailer was composited in a way to subtly show the Shoal logo in the background, which of course also looks like the infinity sign. I'm not really sure how intentional this was, but this franchise has a long history of maximizing creativity with the cards that they're dealt. Like for Splatoween, the blob fish design is meant to look like a smile, as well as the nose thing. And there's two different designs to accommodate for each interpretation. So in this instance, the designers made both interpretations work based on the Halloween prompt that they were given. I think that's pretty incredible, I'm not gonna lie. Anyway, let's move on to Oct's branding. Since their very first appearance, their DJ set had all the 8 branding too. The pads on the DJ sets are four groups of eight, with the number eight being next to each one. And down here, we have what seems to be filled out eights too. Now, this is purely speculation, but I think that same filled in eight shape is designed into the suction cups as well. And it just so happens that the shape of their headphones also kind of resembles an eight. There's already octophones in the game that show the number eight more explicitly, which is even more reason to believe that the character was designed with these subtle characteristics in mind. And if that wasn't enough, when Deadfish or the Pearlbot talk, their text bubbles have an animated pattern with DNA strands designed to look like the number 8, or even the infinity sign. This is a good time to thank Apostle of Order over on Twitter for helping me find this one, as well as some other details in this video. Definitely check them out if you have the chance. Okay, so the three main characters are associated with the number 8, or the infinity sign in some way. What this tells us is that the branding was thoroughly planned out to ensure the reoccurring theme was there in a as many iterations as possible. Even if you don't care too much about the branding, this amount of delicate planning should be enough to make you question what else has been planned out this much, specifically in this DLC. At first glance, it just looks too simple. There's hardly any color, no cool sticker designs, and even much tamer music. But the beauty in analyzing something so simple is that the identity of side order becomes more apparent. For example, let's look at the new typeface being used. Looks very simple, right? The font is designed to be exclusively used for numbers, as we see in the points that the enemies give you, and the floor number. This is probably because numbers are more closely related to the simulation theme. The design of the numbers are clever too. That piece that's missing in the corner of the numbers establishes that glitch feel that was prevalent in Team Order's branding. And it even captures the general computer aesthetic of the DLC using as little detail as possible. The fact that the square missing still allows the numbers to be connected is great for legibility at any size too. It's such a clever and minimalistic font that keeps the entire branding feeling in order. And on the topic of fonts, most of us are familiar with the different types of languages used in the game. But the 
interesting thing here is that only the square script seems to be used in the DLC. It's used as writing on the wall, and those parts where it looks like a matrix loading a room. The square script even transitions into multiple other squares, which again is the same branding as Team Order. There's also these black animated pixel voids on the wall that follow the same logic. If these things look familiar, it's probably because they're in Alterna as loot anchors. And for some reason, there's an Alterna logo on the dash pad that's on the wall. I have no idea why, but it's definitely interesting. These random assets make a lot more sense when you view these levels as simulations. There's a few hints in some of the design decisions themselves, like this design on the wall looks like nodes in a network. Or when you spawn back in, Agent 8 is reconstructed by digital shards, which by the way appears to be a reference to the Octo Expansion manga. Also, the duality spawn in out of nowhere with futuristic animations. And even all the chips on Pearl's palette have geometric designs as well as organic looking patterns to simulate that computer aesthetic that is clearly established here. By the way, it's finally time to discuss Pearl's palette. There's a lot going on here, starting with Pearl's new design being used as her icon, unlike the Pearlbot icon being used when she speaks. This checks out by the way because the website insists that she's actually in there, so I'd be interested to see how this develops in the story. And a quick fun fact about the palettes by the way, is that there was a Nintendo article that suggests there's more palettes apart from just pearls. Maybe there could be a Marina one too, considering her logo is used on cans all over the stages. But that's enough speculation for now. I want to figure out what makes Pearl's palette so cohesive. For starters, the actual board is designed to look like a sound mixer board, presumably to establish Pearl's musical background. And the chips themselves are cleverly designed to look like Pantones, which for anyone that doesn't know, are essentially special colors used for printing. So if you wanted this specific color to get a more vibrant blue in your print job, which is not always possible with a four color printer, you could use a Pantone that best suits the color you're looking for. So essentially the palette has both the musical aspect and the ink color aspects. And I find it interesting too that the top part of the board is so underused. Maybe it's to keep that clean look side order is trying to establish. That infinity logo is back as well, which again is on the back of the pearl bot that spawns in the board in the first place. I just think it's cool that the packaging works so well together. And let's not forget the little pearl on the right side just vibing. Interestingly, the sprite animation has a glow, just like the UI. Isn't it cool how little details like this make everything on the screen feel connected? Speaking of which, the UI does a lot of cool things that show personality while doing as little as possible. For example, this wavy texture is used a lot. It's used on the buttons when choosing the difficulty, the actual chips for the upgrades, and in my personal favorite, on the back of this area where the chip buff is described. It may not look like much, but I guarantee you that a lot of designers would have just left that as a plain shadow. Oh, and something else that's really cool is that when you're in this menu, there's very subtle patterns on the edges of the screen. It sort of looks like a motherboard. Once again, reminding you in the most invisible way possible that this is a simulation. This same effect is on the Splatcast, by the way. There's subtle lines on the edges to make it look like a CRT screen. Again, super subtle, but it's a clever reminder of what you're seeing in context. This last section I want to dedicate to the little bit we got to see of the world building. But only after gushing over Pearlbot's incredible character design, really quickly. She floats with the part that should be her hair, and it even has pinker edges too. The little sliders on her eyebrows only go up and down, yet make her so expressive. The model in its entirety uses squash and stretch, just like actual inkling heads in the game. And her crown is literally floating so that it can have the same charm it has on the actual pearl. She literally does the exact same shocked animation here, and I love it. And the cherry on top is the rigging for the eyes. Not only does it use the same dot pattern seen everywhere else in sight order, but the way they act as pupils that dilate is just so clever. They don't go into the individual circles either but instead just do its own shape, with the glow around it creating the illusion that the shape is working within the parameters of the circle grid. You cannot tell me this design is not peak. Okay, that's enough Pearl talk for this video. So the world building has a lot of great details that I think are worth noting too. 
This machine has octopus-like tubes, transporting black liquid from one area to another. Interestingly, the liquid coming out of the meat grinder looking things are not black ink. They're the same light pink that Agent 8 has. I hope that doesn't mean what I think it does. It also seems like this machine is producing mem cakes, which could hint at a return of Isopadre. And on the subject of Octo Expansion, I think these flying snake looking things are a direct reference to the graphics of the Octo Expansion backgrounds. There's a few windows that reveal a red outside too within the levels. It seems like these windows are everywhere too, if we look closer at the enemy reflections and the Pearlbot's reflections. This tells us that each level is built to feel like a surreal liminal space, but seeing the end of the trailer also shows that there are windowless rooms too. It's just so ominous and creepy no matter where you are. These black electrical explosions compound that feeling too. It's very interesting that the little bit of color on these things use the same colors as Deadfish's character design, which are also the same colors from this screenshot. I'm really looking forward to seeing how these colors are integrated throughout the story. And if it goes beyond just being a visual motif, the enemies literally being dead fishes also raises similar questions. I doubt that dead fish is the antagonist or anything, but all these details put together certainly create a cohesive pattern of references. And that's what a lot of things in side order really are, an interconnected combination of ideas that work well together in a harmonious way, whether it's visually, symbolically, or literally. And these ideas work so well together because there was an intention to make it orderly from the very beginning.